Hello, welcome to the next episode of the Cool Tools um, Show and Tell. Our very special guest this week is the one and only Nathan Merville. <laughs> Nathan, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Um, I'm Nathan Mirvold. Um, I uh, am CEO of Intellectual Ventures. I invent lots of stuff. I build lots of things. Uh, and uh, I love cool tools. Yeah. That's why you're here. I, we're holding our um, agenda to just four tools. Nathan probably has at least 24 that he could talk about, I'm sure. Um, maybe we'll come back. But um, it was a very hard decision, I know, for you to pick out just four so, um, so tell us, um, what's, what's a tool that you would be really loath to lose? Well, uh, one of them is right here. And in fact, this actually uh, is about um, our, his, our shared history, uh, uh, Kevin, because eons ago, I got the Whole Earth Catalog as a kid. And... I remembered very vividly, there's a whole discussion about screwdrivers and how you should never use screwdrivers to pry and do all this other stuff. And that right. you had to like, um, there was a whole thing about if you're in a commune, you had to make everyone promise not to pry or anything else with your screwdriver. So like, I took this to heart that you should have like good screwdrivers. Now, ordinary screwdrivers, I have plenty of them here and that, that, that's that's fine, but I've got lots of lenses and electronics things that have itty bitty tiny little screws. And those little, they're called watchmaker screwdrivers sometimes. They're horrible. Um, they usually have interchangeable little bits. Uh, and some of the large interchangeable bit ones are, are robust. You know, the ones that use with an impact driver are really robust. But the little watchmakers ones are crap. So I finally one day got so fed up with them. I thought, Someone must make a good professional set of tiny screwdrivers. And by God, a German company called Weha does. And they're expensive, but they're great. Yeah. And they fit the little screws just right. Of course, the reason to have a good screwdriver is that you'll damage the screw with a bad screwdriver. Now, damaging the screw, if it's a big old wind screw this big around, well, you get a bunch of things. You go and you strip the, the heads of a tiny screw in a lens, and it's really a problem to fix. Yeah. So uh, this is an example of something where I would be loath to, to lose them. And, in fact, everybody who works with me here knows that if they come into my office, they cannot go and fail <laughs> to return one of these magic screwdrivers. Now, are they like some of the other kits where they also have the – um, magic uh, bits for these odd shaped screws, Torx yes, or the, other security, so, so called security screws. Yeah, that's, you know, I can understand why like public restrooms have screws that you can't take apart because so, some jerk probably went and did. It's less hard to see why you need weirdo Torx screwdrivers uh, for all kinds of other devices. Um, uh, I've got a, another transportation tool. I have a crazy uh, Mercedes G-Wagon that is highly modified and highly capable in off-road things. Well, it needs torque screws for all kinds of very mundane purposes, not a, a thing. And uh, I was actually in a bristlecone pine forest in California. I was photographing these fantastic bristlecone pine trees. Uh and my friend was actually there working on the car because we'd noticed there was some noise we wanted to check out while I was taking pictures. And some German guy comes by and very politely said, excuse me, but I see the vehicle you have. Can I borrow a Torx screwdriver? <laughs> <laughs> Three millimeter size. And we said, uh, sure. Because, <laughs> of course, we had one because you need one for the damn vehicle. <laughs> um, it, yeah. It's. So, so does this set have those as well? Oh, we, it has a whole bunch of them. I mean, the, the trouble is you can never have like all of them, all of them yeah. because some uh, one of the misplaced parts of human ingenuity <laughs> is that folks go off and invent new ones all the damn time. Yeah, yeah, um, that's true. The the, the we are also good because I believe the, the the little yellow tab at the top rotates, so you put yep, your thumb pressure. 
and you can rotate it at the same time. Um, for uh, a project I built uh, a couple of years ago, which is a microscope that was built specifically for photographing snowflakes. Well, for that, I had to use Peltier cooling elements. That's these little solid state devices mm -hmm. that you apply electricity to make something cold. I was using it for cooling the stage of the microscope so it wouldn't cause the snowflake to melt. Well, it turns out it's, those things are very finicky. And so I actually have uh, another cool Weha set that didn't make the thing, but here I am mentioning it. Yeah. They make um, torque screwdrivers that, have, that measure the torque. <laughs> now, I've used torque wrenches on cars before, and there you're talking about foot pounds. Well, these things are like gram millimeters, it's like the incredibly <laughs> tiny screwdriver, but you've got to put those screws in to just the right amount of force. Otherwise, you know, all hell will break loose. Yeah, that's really fantastic. So the Weehaas, we'll have a link to those. It's a set. You can buy them individually too, but this is very convenient in having the little stand and the yes. whole complete now, set. There is something really uh, very comforting about having the complete set. I like that, particularly for the my desk. You know, when I travel, you sometimes have to get a set that either has little bits rather than a whole yeah. screwdrivers, and right. you sometimes have to compromise on not having every size because, like, you know, your car only has some sizes, which is right. what I do on my off-road vehicle, but. Um, here at home where space, well, it's a little bit of an issue, but shouldn't be an issue. <laughs> I have a whole set. Yeah, that's really great. So um, that's a great one, Nathan. So what's a, what's a second um, choice for you? Well, it's this thing, which, you know, I, I, I told you an email what it is, so you don't get to guess, but I think you could have people make a lot of guesses to figure this out. This is a Kuhn Ricken, the brand name, uh, avocado knife. And I love this thing. I would hate to be without it. Um, I, I have another one that I take on camping trips just so I don't lose th this one that's at home. So the thing is, yeah, I, if you like avocados, you, you have to cut an avocado, get the pit out. Then you have to remove the skin from the avocado flesh. And this is the perfect damn tool for doing it. Okay, these serrations over here, well, first of all, they're not very sharp. I can rub my finger on them. Yeah. But they cut an avocado skin just fine because an avocado skin is this rough thing that's on top of a very soft substrate. So just this very gentle, non-threatening uh, edge will easily cut it. So boom, that cuts it. Well, then how do you get the pit out? Well, a lot of chefs do this kind of macho thing where they take a big old chef knife and they go, quack. Right. And they like Im embed right. the thing on it and they pull it off. Well, first of all, if you're going to whack, I, I hate going to whack anywhere near my hand <laughs> because <laughs> what if it goes all the way through or I slip or some other thing? And it's not like an avocado pit is a perfect surface to chop because it's slippery as can be right. and it's round. So it's very easily to have a knife go off. But it's also totally unnecessary to do that. And it screws up your nice big chef knife. This has two little prongs. And you take a little prong and you go pop. Uh, and it, the, the pit flips out. But the best part is this curve here. Yeah. It's got this gentle curve. It doesn't even go 90 degrees. It's <clears throat> probably maybe 45 degrees by the time it's over there. But you take this and you can just lift the skin off and you dip around. You, some people say you're scooping out the avocado, but this is false. If you're actually scooping, then uh, you're leaving a lot of avocado there. What you want to do is lift the avocado skin away from the avocado. And by God, this does it, and you get perfect-looking avocados. It, so, it is, it, yeah, there isn't anything remotely like it either. Yeah, that's right. It's not like, oh, well, I'm going to use, you know, uh, what, a shoehorn? I, you yeah, right. probably could. <laughs> or right. yeah. it, it's its its own special thing. Okay, it's, it's and, and of course, cooking stores are full of single-purpose gadgets. Right. And I have almost all of them. And almost none of them do I ever use regularly because a lot of them are like, oh, well, that was a good idea. But, yeah, you know, I have a cherry pitter. 
And right. if, if I had to pit 50 pounds of cherries, yes. Or you might use it once a year to make a pie, but avocados you're probably eating on a weekly basis. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this, this is another favorite tool of mine. Yeah, that's really great. That's fantastic. I saw that. I was like, yeah, I need to get one of those. Yeah, I, look, they're cheap, but yeah. super well designed. There's other brands besides Kuhn Ricken, but Kuhn Ricken has got all these features, the, the serrated knife and little prongs and everything else. Yeah, that's a real keeper. Thank you. So um, tool number three, Nathan. So tool number three, I don't have right here. It's downstairs. Good. It's basically the size of most of the rest of this room. Uh, it's a CNC controlled. Here I can show my shirt. Run CNC. <laughs> you remember a rap group of a certain vintage that will make even more sense to you. Um, uh, it's a, a CNC controlled abrasive water jet. So uh, I, I have lots of CNC machine tools. I have a whole CNC shop downstairs, and they're wonderful for doing lots of things, but. None do I have an affection for quite like the water jet. And the reason is twofold. One is that the water jet will cut essentially anything. So uh, when I get new camera equipment or I, I've got a new telescope that I've ordered that's coming in, I got to put that in some kind of a case so it doesn't get banged up when I take it up to a mountain to get decent viewing of stars. We cut the foam with this water jet. But... <laughs> I also cut three inch thick granite for the counters in my house with this water jet. And it'll cut essentially anything in between. You know, another thing that's great about it is one of its limitations, oddly. Uh, so it is a two dimensional device. And uh, mine has a bed that's maybe a little bit bigger than four feet by eight feet. So you could put a four foot by eight foot sheet of something down on it. And it will go and it will move this cutter to any position within there with about a thousandth of an inch accuracy. Now, uh, the, uh, the way it cuts is it takes water and it pumps it up to 55,000 pounds per square inch. Okay, that's really a lot. And it shoots that water out of an artificial diamond nozzle. And the water uh, exceeds the sound barrier coming out of there. So. It's, actually, it's kind of loud, although there's a way to make it quieter if you submerge everything in water. So you get this incredibly high-speed water. And for a whole lot of uh, things that you cut, for example, cutting uh, foam or cutting fabrics or uh, a lot of soft material, you use nothing in it. But if you want to cut granite or titanium or steel, and I've, I've cut all those things, you blow in very fine uh, garnet grit in the side. And so that garnet grit gets accelerated up to twice the speed of sound and it comes and it cuts anything. Um, cuts glass just great. We've cut beer bottles in half. I, I, I write a series of crazy cookbooks. And for those cookbooks, we have cut um, Pyrex uh, things in half. We've cut beer bottles in half. We've cut pots in half. It just, it'll cut anything. And it also has an interesting simplicity. It, it's a 2D device. Now, I've got lots of other machine tools fi that are five-axis tools that you can make incredibly complicated shapes with. Well, that's great, but it turns out to make an incredibly complicated shape, you need incre incredibly complicated CAD software and a lot of thinking to make sure that shape is the right incredibly complicated one. Well, two dimensions, though, is simple. Mm -hmm. So any draw program that you use can output a file that this water jet can suck up and it'll cut things. Or if you make the thing move fast relative to how, how thick the material is, it'll etch a line in it. So you mm -hmm. can write stuff in stone or nearly anything else. Um, and all of that is super easy to program with almost any kind of software. Uh, I've done a bunch of things where I make mathematical shapes and I have mathematical software like Mathematica that I use to calculate it. Or you have a design thing or you have, it really doesn't matter. And so I love the fact that it's just a great way of cutting almost any two-dimensional thing to an exact uh, size and shape. 
So there are a number of water jets out there. Is the one that you have a particularly superior one in some ways, nope. um, or is it um, better than the average in some way? Well, I, it's it's the third water jet that I've had, so hopefully it's got some <laughs> advantages. Um, it's made by a company called Omax. It's a funny story. The abrasive water jet was invented by a guy in the Seattle area who started a company called Flow Inter International. And they made the first water jets, and they were located um, in Kent, Washington, just south of Seattle, because that was near Boeing factories, and Boeing was their first big customer. They sold these machines to, to Boeing. Well, after many years of running Flow and it becoming a public company, the founder, I'm sorry for forgetting his name, uh, there was some upset between the founder and the board, as there sometimes is things. So he quits the company, goes across the street, and starts Omax Water Jets. <laughs> <laughs> and I've historically owned both Flow and Omax, and they, they both are quite good. The, the, one of the biggest innovations in water jets, there's two, sort of two big innovations. One is a... Um, a thing about the kerf. You know, when you cut something with a saw, it takes a piece out, which is called the kerf. And the kerf, kerf is about 40, uh, 25 thousandths or a 40th of an inch on a water jet. But the water diverges a little bit as it goes down. So there's a little bit of an angle to it. Well, somebody figured out automatic angle compensation. So it tilts just right so that you have a nice clean edge. The other thing that's great about the software and was a big improvement is when they uh, made all of the um, calculation of speeds and things automatic. Um, machinists always love to talk about speeds and feeds. You know, how fast are you spinning something on a lathe or how fast is the tool spinning mm -hmm. and how quickly can you feed things in without causing, you know, either too much overheating or binding or some other damn thing. And that's part of the skill of being a machinist. And it really is a skill. Well, for the water jet, they took a lot of that skill component away, fortunately. So pretty much you can cut anything. You, know, you tell the software what material it is and it'll go. And um, are there sort of, um, what I would say, entry level um, water jets or is it just where you need a big hefty one if you're going to have one at all? Well, uh, CNC machine tools generally uh, exist these days in every size imaginable. Mm -hmm. From, you know, if I say, how big does a CNC mill have to be? Well, you can have some that aren't much different than the size of my set of screwdrivers. Although I'm exaggerating a little bit, be heavier, yeah, yeah, yeah. more expensive. But you can make a tabletop one and you can make a large one for large material. The other component with all machine tools is you can make a heavy one, which has got a bunch of advantages. It's stiffer. It's less likely to have vibrations or bending or other kinds of crap, which hurts your accuracy. Or you can have a light one. And a, a huge component of what makes a expensive lathe or milling machine expensive is an extra thousand pounds of cast iron. Right. <laughs> and it's really that simple. Uh, so uh, I have a both large um, stock size and large, uh, heavy, stiff water jet. Um, uh, the guys that I have in the machine shop here like big, heavy, stiff tools. Um, they, they're not really happy with a machine tool unless we have to pour extra concrete in the foundation <laughs> to support it. That, that's kind of the metric that says, yep, this is enough. <laughs> Otherwise, they view it as like a flimsy piece of crap. Now, the reality is I've used some flimsy piece of crap tools, and they're, they're not as good in all circumstances. There's a reason you go for this. Yeah. But you can always go overboard yeah. <laughs> uh, that way. So I've... I don't know what the cheapest water jet is, but I know that there's small ones that are uh -huh. a few feet on a side. Now, obviously, you can't put a four by eight foot of uh, right. sheet of, but so what? Yeah. And there's ones that aren't as heavy. Right. And there's one, there's, but, but water jets do have an issue, which is 
be, this pump that pumps the water up to 55,000 pounds per square inch is not super cheap. Mm. So uh, there are uh, a CNC router or a CNC milling machine is in some ways cheaper. Now, the flip side is those routers and milling machines need um, tooling, all kinds of tooling. And they need all kinds of fixturing. And a water jet really doesn't need either one. They're really good at self, um, you know, figuring out where your material is and going right, from right. there. Uh, you don't really need to have precision fixturing. Mm. Um, at least in almost all cases, you don't. Uh, and uh, you don't buy any more bits or tools or anything else. Now, that might be a while before you made up the difference. And you do have uh, consumables. You have this um, garnet sand. Right. Um, but fortunately, that's not too expensive. So it sounds like if you could have only one of these large machines and w- between, you know, a CNC milling machine, maybe a laser cutter, you would have a water jet. In fact, it was the first CNC machine that I bought. <laughs> and for many years, it was the only one. Exactly. Right, right. Now, would you, so you would not. With the fullness hesitate. of time, I do have <laughs> laser cutters. I have a five axis CNC right, right. mill that is ginormous. Uh-huh. And I have all manner of other. Uh, tools and devices, yeah. but it was my first, and I had only that for a long time. Yeah, and you don't hesitate to cut some wood with it either. What would you hes- hesitate to cut wood with? I it? cut wood all the time with it, so it gets wet, but it just dries it off really quickly. Yeah, it. So it, um, it you have to be slightly careful. Uh, MDF, you know, which yeah. is a, it, it's a convenient material for lots of things. It's very uniform and so forth. MDF can cut very well, but not all MDF. If you get too big a, a, a piece yeah, yeah. of MDF or other kind of particle board or other things, the jet, as it's cutting through, may hit a weak layer, and then it goes sideways, oh, yeah. and the whole thing kind of explodes. The plywood? Would plywood work? Plywood works great. Oh, wow. I never knew that. No, okay. I cut... Um, I originally bought a, a water jet for building my house. I know it sounds like a crazy thing to do, and it probably was, but uh, and it was because we had a bunch of stone to cut and we had some metal to cut for decorative things. But my God, it got so we used it for almost anything. So I, I have a media room at home that has uh, plywood uh, panels that have intricate patterns, holes cut in them. They needed holes because you got to put speakers behind them, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> right? Um, did the whole thing on a water jet. Oh, wow. Okay. Now you've sold me. This is really great because I don't have laser cutters or milling machines. And so laser or water jet would seem perfect. Yeah. It's, you know, if you, if you're willing to only cut plexiglass, laser cutters are great. Right. Um. Uh, the CNC routers are great and they will let you cut um, uh, all kinds of sheet wood material, Mm -hmm. but not metal so much, not all of the great diversity of things. Obviously they also let you do shapes and stuff that you can't do with a water jet. That's really great. So um, this is the, again, the, for our listeners is the OMAX. And for you is a five fifty five one hundred. Yep. Um, which you probably should have a basement, <laughs> at least. Well, or a garage. It, it's um, it, when when I was building my house, we installed it in the what was going to be the garage of the house, <laughs> and it lived there all through the creation of said house. Um, uh, so uh, it didn't require any super special power or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that there are way less expensive versions than the one that I have. That's yeah. just yeah. the industrial strength one. Yeah. Well, that's really great. Um, what a lesson. So, um, so Nathan, your fourth tool. Um, I know that you are a huge photographer um, and do brilliant work yourself, as well as the books that you've published. Um, this is a photo-related uh, tool. Tell me about it. Okay, so you know, photography is the art of capturing light. Okay, it really is your medium. Uh, the subject's important, but it's only important insofar as you can bounce light off of it. 
<laughs> or or shine light through it, perhaps. So, uh, for and I I learned photography and did a lot of my photography early on, and still a lot to this day outdoors. And outdoors use the light that nature provides. So when you take landscapes, that's that. But for these cookbooks, I started having to take studio pictures. And for studio pictures, you want to use flash. Um, you can use these. In the old days, you didn't use continuous light because it was very cumbersome. It was tungsten-based or fluorescent-based. And some people used it for stills, but mainly it was a video thing. But flash, uh, still photographers loved flash because you didn't have all the heat with the continuous light output. Uh, and it was very controllable and very precise. So over the years, I've had a number of different uh, studio flashes. Uh, Braun color was one of my favorite, and they, I still have them. They, they last forever. Um, but then I found this, which oh, is the wow. heaviest thing. This is the power pack to a pro photo pack. This is the Pro 10. The current model is called the Pro 11. Now, this power pack is basically a power supply and huge set of capacitors uh. that send power to your flash. But the thing that is special about this one, and it's only this brand and this model, so far as I can tell, at least to do it precisely, is that this will make the shortest duration flashes. So I... I'm sure you were fascinated as I was when you first saw Harold Edgerton's mm. frozen motion shots. And you can use flash to freeze motion of moderately fast, but not terribly fast things. So a typical camera flash has a duration of about a thousandth of a second. And a thousandth of a second is quick, but not quick enough to really capture stuff. And so for a long time, there was this weird divide. You could go up to about a thousandth of a second. And then there was a few hacks you could use to kind of get a little bit above that with ordinary flashes. Well, then Profoto, which mostly makes flashes for studio photographers, and most studio work is either product photography or portraits or things like that. So I'm not even sure why they put this feature in, but this will do a flash down to one 62 thousandths of a second. <laughs> That's fast. That is fast. Now, okay, are you seeing Whoa. this? This uh, is a this is a picture of um two wine glasses with splashed wine. Well, and, kind of, for our listeners, it's kind of in midair. There's it's against a white background, and there's just wine splashing in droplets. And the, the thing I love about it is, of course, if we zoom in here, you'll see that the wine looks like it's a piece of red glass. Like you, yeah. you took molten glass and, and poured it into this thing. It is got, it's shiny, it's perfectly sharp, and it, uh, it's yeah. totally transformed. It's not what you would normally think of. And that's what you can do with this particular flash unit is you can, you can do these incredible stop motion shots, which really can't be done with uh, almost any other way. And um, you were showing this really kind of big, um, uh, looks like, you know, the size of a toaster, which was the capacitor and the power slide, but you also still need, it comes with a flash. And the yeah, flashes then, themselves have to be correspondingly just as fast as the power. Um, well, the thing that's interesting about this is that it will take pro photo flash heads, of which they've been making them for 20 years or more, and it'll make any of them go that fast. I see. So it, the a typical studio flash uh, has a xenon. I can go grab one if if you want to see it. It's got a xenon flash tube in it, uh, and what determines the flash duration is just the profile of how the voltage and current ramps up to make the flash occur, and then ramps back down. I see. 
Okay. So, so there's, a, there's a wider range of bulbs that would work with this power supply. Correct. Okay. Now, you could, they also, Profoto makes a smaller all built-in unit mm. that does this. Mm -hmm. um, I wound up using it so much, I was wearing them out. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I wound up uh, 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 upgrading to, to this guy. And this is more uh, of a studio in the sense that you, it's, it's heavier and kind of stationary, lives on the floor or whatever. Yeah, that's what this does here. Yeah. And then um, you plug in here on the top, you can plug in two different flash heads. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple of these. So for that shot to get the light even, I typically would use four flash heads. Wow. But you could achieve some of this with a single flash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some hacks by which you can... Uh, take a, a Nikon or a Canon little flash that goes on top of a camera and they will, the, the modern ones let you turn it down to one 128th power and at one 128th power, it has a very short duration. Oh, So that's a hack to go do it. And then if you want to go much faster than this, there are some uh, guys that figured out how to overdrive LEDs. Um, and I mean, uh, like burn them out, like, like just disintegrate them? No. Okay. So it turns out when, when the LEDs are rated for a certain current and a certain uh -huh. voltage, you can take, you should take the voltage relatively seriously. The current you can exceed greatly uh -huh. if it's for a short period of time. I see. And so you have to have a short duty cycle. So these guys have a, a flash called the Velo that uh, is made of LEDs. And that will flash at a millionth of a second. <sighs> wow. But it's, it's pricey. And it also um, is, uh, uh, it doesn't put out that much light. Yeah. Uh, for my snowflake microscope, uh, I wound up both building and buying some uh, some other units where I bought commercial LEDs uh, units that were meant for um, lighting microscopes or meant for uh, machine vision lighting for quality control in a factory. And it turns out you can overdrive those suckers too. <laughs> and uh, if, if you drive the voltage too high, you smoke them. Um, if you drive the current, you can pretty easily go to um, four times the rate of current so hmm. long as you're brief about it. <laughs> hmm. um, wow. uh, and uh, of course, the flash that's on your phone is an LED flash. It's not a xenon flash uh, mm -hmm. thing. That's why there's a mode to turn into a flashlight. <laughs> right. Yeah. These were really great, Nathan. I just, I could talk to you all day about some of the ones we didn't get to and maybe we will at some point. But tell me about... Um, what you're currently working on, um, may, maybe your passion project, um, or if you want to talk about what you do at work, but e either way. <laughs> well, here's a passion project that um, this is a 3D printed prototype of something that I will make on a five axis milling machine. Okay. Um, and it requires a bunch of a little explanation. So this is for my next snowflake microscope. Ah. And Ordinary microscopy has a bunch of laws. And one of those laws is for a given uh, microscope objective, there's a, a, a parameter called the numerical aperture, or NA, and that determines resolution. Sometimes you can buy a more expensive one that has a little bit higher NA, but in general, the higher the NA, the higher the resolution. Well, a guy at the University of Connecticut figured out this insanely clever scheme that uses a bunch of LEDs, which you turn on. He used typically a 16 by 16 array of LEDs, which he turns on one at a time, takes pictures with each one. So that's 256 pictures. Then you use software that reconstructs these in Fourier space. And the bottom line is you get to break this law and you can have a uh, microscope objective that has very low NA. So 
uh, NA 0.14 in the case of uh. the one I'm going to use. And uh, <laughs> you can turn it into NA1, which is as high as you can get in air. So, so I just want to see if I can understand this. I understand the idea of like focus stacking, where you um, are going to overcome a shallow depth of field in microscopy, CBC, which is very, really, very narrow. And so you take a series of pictures yep. at different heights uh, in focus, and then you stack them computationally yep. into one solid in focus picture. Is this something similar? And, and like I do that all the time. I'm one of the big, biggest proponents in the world of that. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of the shots I take are composed of over a thousand focus layers that are reconstructed that way. Right. And I've built a whole bunch of cameras here that, uh, and microscopes that are meant specifically to do that. This is different. It's, it's analogous. So a, a focus stacking works because a single photo has a, a specific depth of field, a distance, mm -hmm. a range of distances of things that are in focus. That's another one of these laws. And it is an optical law. You can't really cheat that with conventional optics. You're going to have a finite depth of field. But it turns out, in that case, by having many of them, you can have that finite depth of field for any one, and you put it together, and you get this magical result that no lens could produce. This is analogous in that you're looking, taking lots of low resolution, low resolution pictures, and you're reconstructing it to make a single high resolution picture. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very analogous, but it is a little different because that all occurs in Fourier space, which makes it hard to think about, but it's fundamentally a way of stacking at resolution. Well, to do this, you need to have an array of 256 of these um, LEDs. And what most microscope researchers do is they buy an array from Adafruit that is all ready to go. <laughs> and it's a super cheap array and so forth. Well, for snowflakes, I want to pull, I want to overdrive the crap out of these LEDs so I can view them very briefly. Uh, I see. Because I take, if I want to take 256 photos, if I take that over a long period of time, my okay. snowflake is melted. Melting. <laughs> if I crank up the power, my snowflake melts. Right, 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 right. So this is going to be a hemisphere of aluminum. Oh. Each of these holes has an LED that goes right here. And they're all pointed up at the same spot. This is the spot where the snowflake will sit. Oh, I see. So... And are, are you going to flash them all at the same time? or Oh, you flash them one at a time. One at a time. All right, all right. Okay. So then you need to build this circuit that does that. Yeah. And fortunately, everyone's cell phone has a little chip in it that is the LED flasher. Wow. <laughs> that, that's how the cell phone works. So I bought, well, 500 of those chips, <laughs> something like that. Um, and so those, each one gets to control an LED. Wow. And I can flash each of them. So the electronics are complicated. The optics are com complicated. The program is complicated. But then you have this device, which I don't know if I'll do justice here with this thing. This is a 3D printed example. Right. I'm, I'm going to make it with, say, the 3D milling machine, the five-axis milling yeah. machine. Uh. Um, it's very simple in principle, which is you have a sphere, which is easy to turn on a lathe. And then you, you drill all these things, all pointing at the same spot. So it's a trivial thing to say how you do it. Oh, I've got 256 holes in a hemisphere, all pointing at the midpoint, the, you know, the center of the right, sphere. Right, right, right. But, oh, my God, I never guessed. It wasn't until I did a, a, a simulation of it. Yeah. They had this insanely complicated interior. Right, right. And then it turns out, of course, there are some drilling holes this long is a little bit of an issue. And um, is that I want a job for your water jet. Uh, we thought about the water jet. I think we're going to use the uh, five axis milling okay. machine instead um, to keep the holes. 
if the, if it was a, a thin shell of material, the water jet would be great. All right. For this, I think you need to have some very long channels, and it's easier to long channel if you have a stiff drill rather than yeah. a jet of liquid as your drill. So this is the pro project. Now, making this physical thing is part of it. Making the circuits is another part. And then we have to wire up each of those things to the correct LED. Otherwise, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> um, and then, of course, this thing has to be aluminum. Rather, rather than you, I could say, gee, why don't I just use this nice 3D printed version? Yeah. Well, one is I only made half of it, so yeah. I could see inside. But the other reason is those LEDs need a heat sink. Yeah. <laughs> so this becomes the heat sink. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a pound of aluminum to soak up all of the... Uh, uh, the heat and keep it off the snowflake. Even though those are flashing one at a time because they're doing whatever it is, one twenty-fifth thousandth of a second, it, it'll seem like they're all flashing within a half a second, right? It'll be a pretty short burst. It'll it it, it won't visually it, it won't seem like it's sequential because you don't see them. It'll you might see. If you, you, you'd see something racing around, be, yeah. it'd be like this point of light racing around um, here if you were looking at it from the inside. Mm -hmm. um, That's and wonderful. Of course, it may not work or it may take a long time <laughs> to get it to work, but by God, it seemed like the thing to do. Um, that's really fantastic. So, yeah, the Snowflake photographer machine, that's great. Um, I wonder, that's a great. Um, it's amazing what that original Bentley, I think it is, who did the original Snowflakes, what he was doing Snowflake with Snowflake Bentley, with so, his little camera in the Vermont, or whatever it was. He was a farmer in Vermont, and he happened to live. This is a key part of the story. He lived near Lake Champlain. Now that's important because Lake Champlain has uh, creates what's called lake effect snow. It has lots of evaporation off the lake. The lake doesn't freeze totally freeze over. That means there's a lot of snow in that part of Vermont. And uh, Bentley is working in the 19th century. And he, <laughs> he built this amazing setup, which in some ways I'm envious of. Uh, his camera was enormous. And the lens was outside. Yeah. And the rest of the camera was built inside in a room. <laughs> so now my version of that is I take, I have a snowflake microscope where the whole snowflake microscope lives inside a big uh, pelican case. And so I have to set that up on the balcony of a hotel or an Airbnb that I've rented. And then I have all these cables that come inside because I have the computers inside. <laughs> and the trouble is I have to go outside to be able to find the snowflake and put it on the thing. And then I race inside. And then I'm kind of like Bentley once I'm inside because I can control the thing uh, remotely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now all you need is... is Outside snowflake catcher. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if Bentley took thousands of snowflake photos in the 19th century, uh, late 19th century, and I think he lived up into the early 20th century, and he showed the world what a snowflake is like. Uh, we we really didn't have, I and mean, people had, artists would draw and they would have some idea, but the insane variety and the intricate right. nature of snowflakes, we know all that because of Bentley. I saw a uh, YouTube video somewhere of somebody doing controlled growth of snowflakes where they can dial the speed and the directions of it using, you know, atmosphere, humidity, pressure, temperature. It's not as random, or I should say yeah. it's more replicable than you would think. And that was sort so, of the yes, startling. I know the guy. <laughs> His name is Ken. He's a professor at Caltech. He used to be the chairman of the physics department. And he is an example of a he, I mean, Bentley was obsessed with snowflakes. Then Ken was obsessed with snowflakes. I met Ken a number of years ago. Somehow I caught the bug. I'm obsessed with snowflakes. So Ken has built this amazing machine which will replicate the conditions inside a cloud. Right. And of course, people are often say, oh, well, snowflakes, there's no two alike. Well, first of all, this is false, I'm afraid. 
Um, when you get really nice big flakes, what are called dendritic snowflakes, they have this growth that comes out, looks like a fractal. Those are fairly unique. Not totally unique because the uniqueness is only caused by the parameters of the cloud inside which they grow. Right. Um, powder snow is little hexagonal pellets or little hexagonal uh, cylinders. They're all alike. Yeah. And so one of the problems if you're a snowflake photographer is you don't want just snowflakes. You want pretty snowflakes. <laughs> and it turns out um, Ken and some others have figured out that um, snowflakes uh, are only pretty at a narrow range of temperatures right. from cr extremely cold to insanely cold, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, so uh, I couldn't take snowflake pictures during the pandemic I took a bunch before, but I couldn't take it during the pandemic because uh, Alaska and Canada were both closed. <laughs> <laughs> and Washington State here, oddly enough, doesn't get cold enough. Yeah. Um, most ski resorts do not get cold enough. If you go up on the top of the ski mountain, then you, you might be cold enough some of the times, so not always. But then you don't have power and a bunch of other stuff that yeah. is fun to have. All right. Yeah, that's really great. So um, speaking of at the top of a mountain, and you earlier on mentioned um, your- uh, Anyway, to, to complete the story, Ken built a machine to, to create snowflakes in the lab. Right. And I've seen him do it, and it is uh, amazing. Yeah. It answers the question that I always had was- Yeah, he's, Ken Liebrecht is his name. Right. Was how do the six arms of the snowflake know- well, so what, that, to, you know, I mean, were they communicating with each other? And the answer is no. They were just had exactly the same environment. And that was what. Right. So the, the first thing you need to know is water likes to form hexagonal crystals. Right. So the, the hexagonal aspect is just because it's water. Right. Um, salt likes to form cubic crystals. So if you look at tiny grains of salt, they're either tiny cubes or they're these little pyramid like things which are made of cubes. So that gives you the hexagonal part, but the only reason it grows similarly on one side and the other is that the conditions yes. are the same. Right. Only for a lot of snowflakes, if you look really close, they're not totally, totally. the same right. Right. because right. there was some tiny difference. Right. And yeah. uh, but still, it just is incredible to me to see this in, insane amount of detail yeah. and beauty. Because it has both an element of randomness and an element of extreme symmetry. Yeah. So you see all of this, and you're out there in a snowstorm, and you look out and you think, well, nature's only making about a billion of these <laughs> a minute right now. <laughs> no human intervention, no intelligence, no, right. it's physics alone is coming together and self organizing yeah. to make this crazy complexity across hundreds of square miles simultaneously. Right, exactly. And it has been forever, for millions of years. Absolutely. All right. Um, well, this has really been fantastic, Nathan, really. I really appreciate it and would love to sometimes hear some more of your cool tool picks. Well, I'd love to do it. It was really great. Um, uh, best wishes and success on your snowflake machine. Well, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> I can see a book coming up. I don't know why. <laughs> I have this premonition, but <laughs> um, yeah, the, the question is whether it will be a project like my cookbooks, which is many years of um, uh, of creation and pain, or, or it'll be more like your book <laughs> of many decades of creation and pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but uh, I, I'm sure there will be one at some point. Well, wonderful. I will look forward to it. So again. Thank you uh, very much. I really appreciate it. We're glad that you enjoyed this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Just want to remind you that we have some other coolish material on our YouTube channel here. Please subscribe, comment, like. In addition, um, this Cool Tools Show and Tell is also available in an Audible podcast form. You can subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to other podcasts if you just wanted to listen. And if you're listening, know that there is a visual version of this on our YouTube channel, 
we're we're actually showing the tools and um, there's a little bit more of a visual component there. In addition, the same folks that put us, uh, the Cool Tools website out, we also put out a free newsletter every week. It's very, very short. It's one page or less. We recommend six very brief items um, that are very succinct, easy to read. You can deal with it in a couple minutes. And every week we bring to you the six cool things that we have uncovered and want to share. And it's called Recommendo with one M, recommendo.com. You'll be able to find it there. It's free. Join 50,000 plus other subscribers every Sunday morning. You'll get it in your email box. And it's actually one of the most popular things that we produce. But we do produce other newsletters as well. One of them is called What's in Your Bag. We have one that goes out to um, tools and tips for your workshop. So you can get those at our website um, and they are also free. And finally, um, I wanna mention the fact that um, we do have a Patreon and um, this uh, podcast and this vidcast are supported by Patreon supporters. The minimum is a dollar a month. And for that, you get um, an email to ask us anything. We will respond and um, answer your question if we're able to. There are other higher levels. You can all see those at our Patreon page. And all those links are below right here. So thank you again for being a fan. And um, we'll keep producing stuff if you enjoy it. Thanks. We are thankful for all our Patreon supporters. And this week's supporters include Dave Rogolich, Mock Nerd, Mark Goebel, Stuart Brand, Paul Hosey, Wet Bear, Bill Schuler, Tom Markham, Ellen Lee, and Jim Spofford. We're really grateful for your support. Thank you, each one. 